Thanks, Hal. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Am I coming through? Yep, lovely. And um, do receive in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both for us here and uh, for those watching online, uh, a warm welcome. Um, we're here for him and uh, for the sake of the glory of our God. And um, as we come this evening to our worship, I'm going to read from the book of Proverbs, the first seven verses of chapter 16, because um, there are thoughts contained here that will both help us into the first prayer and, um, and with what we will be looking at later on. So Proverbs 16, verses 1 to 7. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Father in heaven, our gracious Lord, we cannot uh, read what we have just read and uh, not know that um, we uh, are before you as it were naked. There is nothing, Lord, that we can uh, cover over. There is no pretense beyond which you will not see. And you we know, Lord, see into our very hearts. And therefore, we submit ourselves in your presence as sinners. Uh, we know uh, that we are sinners. And more than that, we know that you know that we are sinners. But we also read here that steadfast love and faithfulness atones for sin. And we also have been led uh, to trust in the Saviour, and to have seen uh, with the eyes of faith uh, that supreme example of steadfast love and faithfulness of a Christ that was crucified for us. And it is in him we put our trust. We declare an interest in his blood. And Lord, when we ask, as we do before you, for the forgiveness of our sins, uh, Lord, we do so, uh, pointing to him and what he has done. Lord, we do pray also that we will commit what we are doing here this evening into your hands, that it may be established. Uh, Lord, we do pray uh, that it will be your work that you own, uh, Lord, that you take the glory for. Um, if we are not here for your glory's sake, then we really ought not to be doing what we're doing. Uh, but that is what we are here for, and help us, Lord, even though our hearts are wayward, even though our minds wander, Lord, help us to be for you in this place this evening. We do pray, Lord, that you will come and speak to us. And may it be, Lord, as the scripture says, that you make even your enemies your friends. Do it in this place. We come before you, asking that you will do it because of Jesus. Amen. So we are going to sing our first hymn. Uh, which is All My Hope on God is Founded, after which uh, our brother Simon will come up and give the notices and pray for us. Please stand. <laughs>
I just ask, do I just leave this microphone clip just there? Okay, great. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our service of worship here at Grove Chapel uh, this evening. Uh, our preacher and, uh, and leader of our service uh, tonight is uh, Peter Ireland. Welcome, Peter, and uh, it's uh, great to, uh, to have you uh, standing uh, uh, at, uh, at the pulpit here. I'm, our notices for, um, for the incoming week uh, are uh, as, uh, as follows, and they are small in number because uh, it's still the, uh, the summer holidays and uh, uh, various people are uh, away and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But, uh, but we meet uh, at 8 o'clock on Wednesday um, in the back hall for, um, for prayer, and uh, we... Uh, I look forward to services next week at, uh, at 11 and 6.30. I'm in the uh, vestibule as we came in, there are, uh, there are baskets in which gifts I'm to our two students who will be going away to, uh, to uni, I'm, I guess sometime in uh, September. So uh, whatever things are uh, appropriate uh, um, for, uh, uh, for students, perhaps especially, uh, I don't know, um, jars of hot chocolate or uh, coffee or, or whatever it is that uh, um, you remember perhaps from uh, student days was, uh, was a good thing to be armed with. Um, gifts can be placed in, uh, in those two uh, boxes there. Um, we um, will now turn our hearts and minds to, uh, to prayer. Um, we did pray this morning for that nation of, of Afghanistan, and uh, um, I think it's right that uh, that we should uh, uh, continue to um, to uh, to do that. Um, the uh, the plight of uh, uh, the people there is uh, um, so very great. Let us turn our hearts and minds uh, um, together in uh, in prayer. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, the, uh, uh, the psalmist uh, asks, uh, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot a, uh, a vain thing? The kings of the earth uh, take their stand. The rulers take counsel uh, together against the Lord and, uh, and your anointed one. And we know that the, uh, the Lord who uh, is uh, enthroned in the heavens uh, laughs. You hold mankind uh, in our different rebellions, uh, in, uh, in derision. Because as for you, you have set your king on Zion, your, your holy hill. But in the meantime, the, uh, um, the raging and uh, the, uh, the um, uh, unceasing uh, work of uh, um, of the devil uh, um, and uh, the wickedness of mankind um, um, is like the, uh, uh, the ceaseless uh, rolling of the oceans. And so we do uh, pray uh, for, um, for that country and for the people of that country. We begin by praying for our own government who uh, um, had uh, some uh, role in what happens and uh, um, they, uh, they may yet do uh, this or that, and we pray that you would grant them wisdom so that uh, uh, whatever actions that they take um, are, uh, um, uh, are actions with, uh, with good um, outcomes. We pray that they may even uh, in this uh, hour of their uh, helplessness turn to, uh, to you for, um, for, for wisdom. In, uh, in whatever decisions uh, they make. We pray most especially for our brothers and sisters uh, um, in, uh, in that country. We pray that, uh, that you will uh, uphold them. We pray that you will uh, grant them the, uh, the wisdom uh, of serpents at the same time as the gentleness of doves um, in uh, whatever uh, they find um, that they uh, that they must needs um, to uh, to do. Um, we pray that uh, uh, that you will grant them a uh, a most beautiful um, testimony. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. 
and uh, who but um, your people have uh, any truly good news to, um, to declare in, uh, in that country. We pray that you will keep them to, uh, um, to, be, uh, to be safe through all this, improbable as that, uh, as that may seem. We remember that you said to Abraham that you were his shield and his exceedingly great reward as he uh, um, walked as a nomad through territories surrounded by every different kind of, uh, of potential uh, enemy. We do pray for your restraining hand against the, uh, the evils that, um, that are reported and the evils that are surely uh, schemed upon and, uh, um, and intended um, by uh, all of those people with so much weaponry uh, um, at their disposal and uh, um, so much uh, uh, motivation to, uh, to do what, uh, what they think uh, is pleasing in, uh, uh, in the sight of, of their God. We do thank you that uh, I'm, uh, the, uh, the rulers of this earth uh, can do nothing unless uh, I'm, they, uh, they have uh, your uh, um, approval. And therefore we do pray uh, earnestly for the restraining hand of, uh, of the Holy Spirit in that place. And we do pray that... Uh, uh, where the name of, uh, of Yahweh is not, uh, is not much known uh, in, in that country, um, we pray that, uh, um, that you will yet be glorified by uh, those coming to faith um, in that place. We do bring before you uh, the needs of, um, of our own uh, um, members here. We are reminded as we looked around at the church that, uh, that there are um, some uh, empty pews of some folk who would uh, earnestly delight to be, uh, to be with us, but uh, for um, various different reasons are uh, I'm laid uh, aside I'm with uh, different uh, frailties. We pray that, uh, that you will uphold them. We pray that there will be uh, a time... Uh, I'm when each of them can uh, uh, rejoin us uh, here. We pray that uh, uh, in the meantime they will know your upholding and, uh, and your keeping. We pray that they may have a, uh, a sweet fellowship with the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ I'm in their different uh, home uh, situations. We do remember before you the uh, different uh, missionary works that uh, are dear to our hearts um, and are uh, supported by, uh, um, by uh, um, uh, us here um, in, uh, in their different places, um, in their different works. We uh, um, pray that... Uh, uh, that you will uh, uphold them. We pray that uh, um, you will uh, grant the works that they are engaged in to, uh, um, to have uh, um, good uh, um, outcomes. Um, we uh, um, pray that, uh, that they may uh, uh, look to you for strength and for, um, for help. Um, um, and for, uh, um, for gospel fruit um, in the different works that, um, that they are engaged in. We do thank you that uh, um, some of our um, families uh, in the church here, they, uh, they look forward to, uh, uh, to new um, arrivals. We thank you for the marvel of... Um, the, uh, uh, the growth uh, of a baby in, uh, in a womb. We thank you that they are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made, um, as the psalmist uh, uh, calls us to, um, to take note. 
we pray that uh, that you will bring each of these uh, um, uh, babies to um, um, to a safe readiness to be delivered, and then a safe uh, arrival uh, um, uh, among us. We pray that we will, in due course, uh, be delighted um, to meet each of uh, these little ones. Um, we pray that, uh, that in due course, uh, um, that you will bring uh, each of them to, um, to faith, even as we make that the prayer for, um, for every uh, um, uh, babe who has grown up to uh, a child and, uh, and beyond um, uh, in and amongst us here as a, uh, as a church family. Thank you for the, uh, the ongoing work of, uh, of knocking on uh, many doors around uh, the, uh, in the streets around. We pray that you will be pleased to uh, open the uh, doors where there is a good conversation to be had and uh, to uh, keep the, uh, the doors closed where there is uh, honestly uh, uh, no interest and... Uh, um, any conversation would, uh, would simply be uh, a frustration. We pray that, um, that the good news may be uh, sown in that uh, fashion of, uh, of deep soil and that, uh, um, that you will be pleased to grant uh, um, new life of this uh, spiritual kind, the kind that comes only by the work of, uh, of the Holy Spirit. I'm in the homes uh, around and about us uh, here. And we do pray for um, the, uh, the different uh, um, uh, students uh, among us. I'm having a, uh, a broad uh, um, description of, uh, of anyone who is a student. Their, uh, their learning has been so uh, wretchedly disrupted. Um, in these uh, last uh, 18 months, and whether they are about to return to, um, to school, to college, to, uh, to uni, to, um, to wherever it is, um, we pray that, uh, um, that they will uh, find a more normal um, circumstance um, in, uh, in the new academic uh, term. We pray that... Uh, I'm where they are uh, going away, I'm as uh, some of our uh, young people are, to, uh, to um, places to study, I'm that they will there find uh, good friends, that they will there find uh, um, good churches, that they will there be able to, uh, to blossom um, into uh, uh, godly uh, I'm young uh, adults. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Simon. Um, it's remarkable, isn't it? Um, that psalm he quoted in his prayer earlier. I, in my deliberations, I nearly used that in place of the Proverbs. Uh, 16 I read earlier and finally decided on the proverb 16 but we got the psalm psalm 2 isn't it psalm 2 uh, as well um, so that's wonderful um, we're going to sing again now um, behold the immortal lamb I think um, is it the second line of the refrain repeated yes yeah so the second line of the refrain is repeated um, to the praise of God please stand
Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, our main reading for this evening comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 45 to 53. It's subtitled in the ESV, The Plot to Kill Jesus. John 11, 45 to 53. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. This is the word of God. Um, Mind the gaps, this is called. Mind the gaps. Um, I I wanted to say uh, something that illustrated how different people can use the same words and mean different things by them. And the illustration that came to mind, kind of in keeping with the, the title and the theme, Uh, was of a certain somebody I know who works on the railways and as a railway worker is required to wear the uniform. Uh, The reason why he's required to wear a uniform is that he works among members of the public and if, as is often the case, a member of the public has an inquiry about the service the railway provides, uh, they can spot the man in uniform and say, he will know, we'll go and ask him. Only this certain somebody I know doesn't like members of the public keep coming up to him and asking him what are him distracting questions. So he doesn't wear the uniform, logically enough. Or he wears it in such a way as to disguise that he's wearing it uh, with all the badges and the logos covered over. Uh, and he can move among the public unmolested. But when a member of his management team notices this and pointedly remarks, you know, if you wear the uniform, the public can see that you work for the company, he just as pointedly replies, that's right, if I wear the uniform, the public can see that I work for the company. Same words, two different, even opposite meanings. They intended by them that you should be seen, and he that you shouldn't, as he puts it. The logic is perfect on both sides. And our text for today is is a bit like that. Uh, In fact, the words in question could not be different because they are God-given words. In verse 50, we read, it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And when Caiaphas says these words, he is prophesying. Although, as Paul, as Paul Hewlett pointed out some while ago, he doesn't know what he has. And the working question is, how do prophet and prophecy come to diverge in this manner? How does Caiaphas take upon his lips words whose true import, while they may make sense in an earthly context in which he speaks them, is still lost on him? Uh, Truly, to paraphrase first verse 1 of um, Proverbs 16, which we read earlier, the plans of the heart belong to Caiaphas, but the answer of his tongue was from the Lord. Here is a council, C-I-L, council, on earth, convened on earth for the purposes of discussing salvation of sorts. And parallel to this in the eternal councils, S-E-L, of God, we might be apt to think of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit taking counsel together for the purposes of discussing salvation 
of sorts. God, is this some, the way we sometimes put it, is God, having of his mere good pleasure, decided that not all mankind will stay in that state of sin and misery into which all mankind would fall. Uh, but some, his elect, will be delivered from sin to salvation by a redeemer. The only redeemer, of course, being the Lord Jesus Christ. And that picture of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, similarly arranged in conference as their earthly counterparts, may be a helpful one to us in our finite understanding of the things of God. But God is an omniscient being, one who knows all things all the time. Which means that there was never a time, ever, when the true meaning intended in these words is his better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the nation, the whole nation should perish, was not a thought in the mind of God. The true meaning of these words has always been a thought in the mind of God. It's as though a great general has crossed the no man's land between eternity and time and placed into the hands of his opposite number the battle plans he has, as if to say, there you go, this is what I intend to do. Knowing that in seeking their own ends, they would fulfill his very purposes. Of course, the scope of the plan of salvation ever in the mind of God is far greater than that of these self-serving Jewish religious leaders. To gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad, verse 52. But we're saying, you've got to follow me here, but we're saying that Caiaphas, while he may not have fully understood God's intention in these words, still manages to stay in the context of the situation he's addressing. Such degrees of psychological complexity are possible in regard to divine human interaction. An atheist, for example, seeks to deny at one level of his understanding that which he knows to be true at another level of his understanding. So we could refine the working question slightly and pull it this way. How does uh, the one prophesying come to diverge in his thinking from the actual prophecy he utters and still stay in the context of the debate in which he utters it? I'm saying we shouldn't expect him to say something so out of context that those intending Christ's death for their own sakes are given to understand something other than their earthly intention. I think there's a judicial hardening going on. Um, so we're going to understand these things by minding three gaps. And this is the first gap. Um, and the first thing of use in exploring this is to look at the verses immediately preceding the one in which Caiaphas prophesies, verses 47 and 48, because it's to correct what is said there that Caiaphas is prompted, humanly speaking, to say the things that God has given him to say. Verse 47 and 48, what are we to do? For this man, Jesus, performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. What is the problem here? In a word, Jesus. Jesus is so gaining in popularity with the people, he can no longer be dismissed as the carpenter's boy from Nazareth, out of which, incidentally, nothing good ever comes. But it's the way the council expresses its fear of the consequences that sounds a little odd. What do they mean by the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation? Surely that has already happened. Surely the Romans have already taken away their place and their nation. Why do they express themselves in future tense about something that has happened? This council is taking place under Roman occupation. It may just mean that the Romans, having already taken away their nation, will now come and take away their place in it, uh, that they will lose the standing that they have in that society. And there's much in that suggestion. There's much worry in that that, that is fueling their debate. 
Uh, but that would still leave the question how it was these leaders came to forget that they had no real authority. Their place was mere puppetry. They had it on lease. The true answer, I think, may well lie in an understanding of the way in which the Romans did empire. And I think it comes out here and in other parts of scripture. It was a feature of the Roman Empire that the Romans allowed to the nations over which they ruled a degree of autonomy. Basically, if you paid your taxes, rendered unto Caesar that which was Caesar's, Matthew 22, 21 and others, and didn't engage in sedition, they left you alone to conduct your own affairs. If you forgot who was in charge, however, and sought to make one of your own king by force, as they had tried with Jesus back in chapter 6 and verse 15 of this gospel, the Romans would come in and crush the rebellion and the rebellious in true Roman fashion, i.e. not policing by consent. The brutality of the way they dealt with insurrection meant being able to maintain a distance between them and their subjects. There was a gap. And it was in this gap that the religious leaders operated. Given the degree of latitude they had, they could quite easily forget that they had no real authority. Day-to-day -day dealings of the people would have seen them inquiring of their religious leaders, not the ruling Roman authorities. You appeal to the Roman authorities for special reasons, like crucifixion. And this is why Peter in Acts 2, 23 says, you crucified and killed Jesus by the hands of lawless men. So maintaining the status quo meant for these religious leaders safeguarding their assets. The long robes, the greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, the places of honour at feasts, Luke 20, 46. And you don't really have to look that far in world religions today to see a similar thing going on. Maybe it's mansions and limousines and private jets, but it's the same scam. So you could see why all, all of this, losing all of this would worry them, and you could see the sort of salvation they have in mind in their deliberations, their own. Nothing and no one must be allowed to upset this arrangement. If Jesus is the problem, remove him. Interestingly enough, um, some translations translate place as temple. It's rightly translated place, but most certainly the temple would have been central to their thinking, being central to all. The great irony is, it's that which they sought to keep, that is the very thing they lost, fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus in Luke 21, 6, that there will not be left here one stone upon another. The Romans in AD 70 did come and take away their place, showing again the foolishness of trying to hold onto what you cannot keep. Um, we were reminded again of that this morning, um, of the temple. But how did the Jewish religious leaders uh, operate in that gap afforded to them by Roman autonomy? How did they maintain their position? And here we need to mind a second gap. Um, and to start with, let me tell you something you've heard before, most of you, that God, or religion, was invented in order to keep the people down. The thought here is there is no God. It was all made up in order to subjugate the masses. To corroborate their view, proponents of it will, try, will point to the many abuses carried out in the name of religion, past and present. Anything from the mental lockdown of adherents relentlessly chanting vain repetitions hour after hour some of them with words they don't even understand, to the extremes of those willing to take their own lives and the lives of many others by blowing themselves up. Look, they say, <clears throat> that proves God was invented just to manipulate people to the ignoble ends of the unscrupulous. But theirs is the ultimate in specious arguments. It's fine sounding, but actually flawed, as Calvin and doubtless many others have pointed out. It doesn't really make sense. And to see that it doesn't make sense, um, all we need to do is be atheist for a minute. Um, let's say there is no God. 
but you want to devise a means by which you will control the people. So you approach the first people group you wish to exercise control over, and you say something like, from now on, these things you will do, and these things you will not do. Uh, we can anticipate the question, well, why, why should we do these things and, and not do these things? Ah, you reply, because God, bear in mind there is no God, says so. You see straight away that's not going to work, is it? God, who or what is God? Well, he's an invisible being. Well, that's convenient. And he lives somewhere beyond the sky. I bet he does. And he made you and me and everything else. And he says that this is the way you should live. And he attempts to explain the thing of such a non-existent being. And he pushes the thing further and further out of sight. The only reason talk of God and his holy and righteous laws works is because God does exist, and people being made in his image have a basic sense of right and wrong despite of sin. There is already that in man that receives such things. They resonate with people, further evidence in the existence of God. And the Jewish religious leaders of Christ's day knew well the value of majoring on the do's and don'ts. These they knew to be the very thing to put folks on the back foot and to elicit feelings of guilt and a sense of being beholden to lawgivers. But you might have a question in mind. How could they use the law to their own ends? Um, seeing as we are all by first creation under the law, seeing the law judges those most severely who would judge by it, how do you get to present the law in such a way that those to whom you present it are made to feel condemned, but are still left with the impression that you are somehow above it? And I think this brings us up to date, because the last few years have run rife with um, conspiracy theory. And conspiracy theories are excellent for making polar opposites of people. Uh, there is scarce any middle ground on which folks can meet. One commentator, speaking of what it was like to try to explain to his opponent the glaringly obvious mistake he was making, um, and finding he could make no headway, said it was like trying to nail jelly to a wall. But why then do people persist in such things otherwise intelligent people, I mean. It's because there's always a kernel of truth in them. There'll always be something to which a conspiracy theorist can appeal, something everyone holds to be true when challenged. And it will be this the theorist falls back on, knowing its undeniable nature. There's so much for being, brought, bring up, being brought, bang up today, but what about the religious leaders of Christ's day? We were asking how it is they could present the law of God in such a way as to make their hearers feel beholden to them without giving the impression that they too were judged by it. And it is by overlaying that kernel of truth, because the law of God is good, the law of God is holy, we're told. There's nothing wrong with the law of God, but it's, that's the kernel of truth over which they lay the traditions of men. And um, in that way they achieved their ends. The list of do's and don'ts was endless. And challenges to their authority would have been made to feel like challenges to God himself. It was a give glory to God, man. So what is this gap we are minding? It really is the gap between the knowledge of the existence of God, which all have been made in his image, and the knowledge of how to be put right before this God, the truth that sets us free, John 8, 32. If you want to use religion to exploit people in order to gain lucrative ends, keep them in that gap. You'll get to make from it and what could possibly go wrong for you. We've already said what is going wrong for this council of leaders. The problem is Jesus. It's not just that somebody went to the Jesus meeting. That's the new religious fad in town, and as everybody knows, new religious fads are ten a penny. It's rather the report this someone brought back from the Jesus meeting and that the Jewish religious leaders got wind of 
this Jesus doesn't speak as our leaders speak. He speaks as one who has authority. His teaching astonishes us, Matthew 7, 28, 29. He's lifting us out of that gap in which we are vulnerable to exploitation and he is setting our feet on firm ground. You can put all your weight on his every word. You see, that's the game changer. That's the stone cut out by no human hand, striking at the feet of iron and clay. Once it becomes a question of authority, those exercising it illegitimately have much to fear. And when you can back your words with actions, the fact of your authority becomes undeniable. What sort of authority does the voice of Jesus command? Lazarus, come out. Verse 43 of this chapter. And the trigger point for this council. As you can see, the, what is the necessary inference here? If Jesus speaks as one who has authority, and he speaks not as their leaders speak, then they have no authority. They have been rendered obsolete. Can you see the fear that is driving the debate in this council? What are we to do? What are we to do? Verse 47. And in this, they have something in common with the Romans, the fear of a challenge to their authority. I wondered who the everyone of verse 48 refers to. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Uh, not absolutely everyone, surely, because then that would have to include themselves in that, uh, if that were the case. Enough of the people did to dislodge them from their position. Enough of the people to bring it to the attention of the Romans, most certainly. We know that the council's view of salvation is self-centred, contracted to their own wants and desires. But what of God's intentions in these words? It is better for you that one man should die for the people. And what of those other words? To gather into one the children of God. Because the council, in a sense, did get its way. The problem of Jesus was removed and taken to a hill and crucified according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, Acts 2, 23. The logic was perfect on both sides. May I suggest that Jesus is still the problem? And I want us to look finally at one, possibly two more gaps. Um, gap three is that there has been a gap of some 2,000 years, give or take, since these events took place. Into that gap, the vainest imaginations of the thoughts of men's hearts have been poured. We were given early warning of this, even in the apostolic age, when faced with the prospect of the return of this same Jesus, the event which will close this gap finally. There will be those expressing doubts. Where is the promise of his coming? 2 Peter 3, 4. And they have not been slow in their labours to fill this gap. I'm only skimming the surface here. But, for example, the free grace of God became a saleable commodity with salvation purchased, but not with the blood of Christ. To, to, to discover the true self, they said, we need to look within ourselves, not to the God in whose image we are made. Morality, they said, was dependent on the age in which we lived, or the standard of living we had to start with. Forget the Ten Commandments. Then they said that God was dead and that we needed to work out that fact and its implication and how we thought of ourselves, how we might live without the givens of the universe. But it's a how we are still waiting for an answer to. Perhaps sex is the answer. We should define ourselves as sexual beings, making one aspect of what it means to be human count for all. And don't geological timescales discount the biblical account anyway? I think all the geology you need was given to us this morning. They will say to the rocks, fall on us. They will be in caves trying to pot out, pothole their way out of judgment, and no good that will be for them. 
It isn't just that the people have become undecided as to the gender they wish to be identified with. They're not even sure they wish to be part of the human race anymore. In forgetting who God is, they forget who they are. I have news for these people, for everyone. And these same words, like as not, will mean different things to different people. To some it will be good news, to others bad news. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. These three words, Jesus will return. The gap will close. Then you will know, I hope it's not too late, that the only thing of which you might rightly have spoken of as filling that 2,000 year gap is grace. God allowed that gap to gather into one his children, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Our passage in 2 Peter 3, 9. Do you know what to do with the problem of Jesus? Because if you don't, we might need to talk about another gap, one which will open for you and never close. A fixed gap described as a great chasm in Luke 16, 26. I'm just thinking out loud here. Um, I wondered when I was preparing this if there would have been those in this council that was convened um, plotting to kill Jesus, who will meet their end in this way, that when stood before a risen and glorified Christ, still bearing the marks in his hands and feet, in his head and side, finally come to understand the true meaning of those words, it is better for you that one man should die and hear themselves saying out loud in the presence of Christ, ah, yes, now I see, it is better for one man, it was better for one man to die, who are then sent away to everlasting condemnation beyond the reach of any who would cross over to save them. With Jesus saying to them, you have said, you have said. It's a frightening thought. But I want to leave in conclusion a, a thought of hope. Um, because we could have read all this very differently and traced every liniment of our own spiritual countenance in all the malevolence of these people right down to the snitty ones of verse 46. I don't know if you saw them there. Some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. I, I take it they're, they're sort of snitchy people. They probably don't get anything out of it but a pat on the head, probably not even liked by the people they serve. Um, they don't get to wear the robes or sit in the best seats, but that's us. That's us minus grace. What can the, God, the grace of God make of us? Who should we be among all that we've considered? Well, as if to illustrate that the first will be last and the last first, I'll draw your attention to those first mentioned. There, right at the front of our passage, verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with, Je with Mary and seen what Jesus did, believed in him. That's it. That's who to be. Be among those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised the temple of his own body in three days. He will raise on the last day when the grace gap finally closes all who have come to him, John 6, 44. Speaking personally, I'm glad that gap didn't close, let's say about 26, 27 years ago. I'm glad that the Lord spoke to the one who was dead in trespasses and sins and said, Peter, come out, live. And I want you to leave, uh, I want to leave you with this um, from the heart. Um, uh, I want to commend to you the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our loving Father in heaven, uh, there is no uh, power in me uh, or in my voice. Um, it's only what your Holy Spirit can take and declare to the hearts of people of the great love uh, that emanates from you and is displayed there in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Lord, I pray that you would make everyone wise to these things, and that they all look up to the cross of Jesus, see their need of him, repent, and put all their weight on his every word, and their trust in his actions. Lord, we do pray uh, that you would so work these things, that people will know and understand them, for your glory's sake, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to conclude our worship with singing our third hymn, uh, Years I Spent in Vanity and Pride. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen. Amen.